welcome in. It's Farmcast for the Community. I'm your host, Tim Brown, coming to you from the University of Georgia's College of Pharmacy, as always. You know, this month we've already had one segment posted, and it was really about contraception, emergency contraception, access to medications for ladies, and looking at the fact and dealing with pregnancy, which I thought was so timely with everything that we've had going on in the media and realizing that here in Georgia, we want to make sure people understand their options and where they can go to. To take it to the next level, there's been something else in the media that just won't go away, and it's a little virus called monkeypox. And in just a moment, we're going to have a big discussion about that. But I want to remind you, next month, I actually have Georgia Overdose Prevention coming on board. The two ladies who created this organization and give access to naloxone for those who have opioid use disorder will be here talking about naloxone access, how you can use it in the community, and who you should be looking at in terms of saving their lives with this precious drug. So join in, listen. I've had these ladies speak before, and it's incredible incredible, the wealth of knowledge they bring, but also uh, the fact that they are able to build this organization in Georgia with very little money and a lot of support from the community. It all relies on what you guys have done, and I want you to sort of get that benefit as they talk about it. But before we get to October, as I teased, we've been talking a lot in the media lately about monkeypox. It has been a huge discussion point, and so I thought we would really hit this talk today doing something that I call interprofessional. I have both a physician and a pharmacist guesting today, and we're going to talk about monkeypox, management, how it comes about, but also the vaccine that everybody's talking about and a little bit of treatment. So let me introduce my guest. I have Dr. Antonio Luis. Hi, uh, Dr. Luis. How are you? I am good. How are you? Doing well. And I have Dr. Daniel Chastain. Hey, thanks for having me. No worries. You guys might recognize Dr. Chastain. He's been on a couple of times. He's an infectious disease pharmacist working in Albany. He is an associate professor here at the College of Pharmacy and acts as a preceptor not only to pharmacy students, but other learners as well within the hospital healthcare system within the Albany area. Dr. Luis and I got a chance to meet a couple of weeks ago through a mutual friend. I know he is an internal medicine trained physician and in Florida, and you're getting ready to start your own practice, right, Dr. Luis? I am. I am trying. <laughs> you're trying. But in the meantime, I, as you're talking about this, internal medicine, primary care, Correct. you and I were talking when we first met that there were people in Florida where you're practicing who were coming down with these symptoms, but no one was really seeing them. So tell us a little bit about monkeypox. What does it mean? And how did you know so early on that this was something that needed to be seen by yourself when others necessarily weren't seeing these patients? Sure. Well, monkeypox is caused by a virus um, that comes out of Africa. Um, and it started gaining attention back in May um, when there was an outbreak that happened in the UK. And, you know, May is a time that there's a lot of people that gather and then they start traveling places. And so it wasn't too soon till I started noticing that it was traveling to the US and kept on traveling and then friends and some patients were popping up with, with strange rashes. And that's when I started, uh, one of my friends came to me, he had this rash, we went to his doctor, his doctor refused to do anything about it. And so that's when I kind of took it upon myself just to be like, all right, let me reach out to the health department, see where we go from here. And then I ended up with a slew of patients. With and I know you've seen a number now, I, monkey pox is a virus. It, the monkeypox, why is it called that? Um, I'm not sure why it's called monkeypox because it comes from rodents. I think it might have to do with its roots in Africa, more in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and okay. Western Africa. Um, but it is a, a ver varicella virus, a variola virus that actually um, is in the same family as smallpox. So probably just to keep a name that people can remember in their head. Um, it just seems like friend. an odd name that it comes from rodents, but yet it's yeah. monkeypox. I'm just trying to make sure that people are like, oh, did this come from monkeys? No, it, no, it, it comes from rodents. In fact, there was one time that it, there was a uh, outbreak that came from prairie dogs that were being uh, shipped illegally to the U.S. Okay, Dr. <laughs> Chastain, you don't have any prairie dogs hanging around, do you? I got rid of them last week. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, no, both of you are, I mean, dead spot on. Um, it was actually first detected in some captive monkeys. Um, it was kind of the link as to, as to where it all came to be. But you're right, definitely comes from primarily a, a rodent vector more so than anything else. Because I mean, there was a big discussion. Do we rename it? What do we do with it? But I think Dr. Luis hit it on the head. Smallpox, monkeypox, same kind of strain of virus. And, you know, the one thing about 
I guess talking about smallpox in our generations, we've never really seen or had anybody entered the medical practice with smallpox. I, I just remember Queen Elizabeth's time back in the day, not the not the monarch recently, but the original Queen Elizabeth. There was a big smallpox outbreak. So has monkeypox been around for a long time or is it something brand new? I mean, you talked about Africa, but Dr. Luis, is this something that we've known about for a while? We have known about it. I think the first cases were seen in the 1970s. Okay. Um, and then there's been sporadic outbreaks into bigger regions, but it's endemic in uh, Western and Eastern Africa. So it's Central and so Eastern Africa. Yeah, so but on that continent, but in the U.S., this is kind of a newer aspect with travel uh, back and forth. The prairie dog incident that happened in, I think, in the Midwest was in 2003. Got it. And usually it, it doesn't get out of Africa. It might go to the U.K. because it's closer, but for the most part, it, it's self-sustained. It's interesting that, you know, as we talk about globalization of healthcare, we see more and more people moving around the world a little bit easier, and it's you know, again, that exposure. You talked about how you had some friends kind of show up and, and their primary care doc just didn't want to see them or didn't want to address it. What kind of symptoms do people usually walk in the door with that's kind of a, I guess you need to be worried if you see this. If you're listening to this podcast, what things should I be looking for? Well, usually in, in this strain, it's been a flu-like illness that then has a rash. And what's different about this is that it has been showing up in the mucosal membrane area, so your rectal area, and your mouth area, uh, you'll, it's very, very painful. And there might be anywhere from one to two to hundreds. And I've seen all of it. Um, Yay. It, the, and they're sores, right? They, they're little sores that can turn into scar tissue, which can be a little bit concerning in the rectal area, since that is a closed system. Sure. And then in the oral area, it just makes it very painful to just do anything. Well, in both areas, honestly. Dr. Chestnut, I know in Albany, you have had some folks walk in the door thinking that it could be monkeypox. Have you had a, have you had the opportunity to rule people out just by symptomology or how do you, how do you know what it is or is it monkeypox? So we've had a couple of people, I, I primarily work inside of the hospital um, on an infectious diseases consult service. So we get asked to see patients, but most of our, our patients we've talked to from a historical standpoint to, to figure out what they've been doing and where they've been. And also the nature of the rash is this, has this rash been going on for six months? And if so, that kind of tells you that this probably is not going to be monkeypox. Um, and then we've had some molecular testing, some, some swabs that we can do and send out to some state labs um, very early on that will have really good detection as to whether the monkeypox virus is around or not. Oh, so, I mean, I, I think you make a great point. If I've had a rash for three months, it's probably not monkeypox. Um, so it comes on fairly quickly, flu-like, and that rash turns into like little pimples that turn into sores is the way you guys are describing it. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And it can be just one solitary one, or it can be several. Aye, aye, aye. Dr. Chestan, you were going to say something. I was just going to say, right. I mean, it could be, you know, certainly mucous membranes, hands, and, and even chest and face um, yeah. as well. That's what I've seen. Okay. I admit you guys, I get a fair amount of education from TikTok. And early on, there were so many people posting where they had the, they had contracted the virus. And what I saw was, Obviously, I didn't see inside their mouth and those kinds of the, the mucosal that you talk about, Dr. Luis, but their faces, the chest, it looked so painful. Um, and it, from the way it looked, it scabs over, the, the sores scab over. Um, but it almost, I almost thought to myself, it's like chicken pox on steroids because the lesions were so big. Yeah. Well, smallpox on steroids. Yeah. Except well, Grant, but I've never seen smallpox. I've seen chicken pox, you know, yeah. where you get the pox, but this just like, these look like they were huge on these poor folks. They could be, they could be very tiny and several or, or big, large ones and, right. and they scar. So like the most painful ones I've seen on people have been in their face, their hands, and of course in the genital areas. Those are the ones that you really want to watch out for. Um, but like, I mean, especially if they're messing with it, they can get very large. And right. scab over, and then it just takes a while. And know, there's, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I've, I've, there's been some some case reports and some discussion um, about even bleeding risks in some of these individuals. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're talking about 
you know, very fragile tissue and, and especially the, the colon overall. And if we have rectal lesions that involve the rectum, I mean, any sort of manipulation could certainly cause a, a bleeding risk. Well, I think to your point, Arches, those are even on like blood thinners. Right. Sure. Absolutely. Like, you know, taking a, even an aspirin a day could make that even worse with these open wounds. And that I didn't even think about the bleeding risk. That's a really great point of discussion that we should be watching that folks on blood thinners and taking uh, antiplatelets for any kind of cardiac or, or stroke uh, prevention. You know, you guys both are in two separate places. I know Dr. Chastain is more of an inpatient hospital based. Dr. Luis, you're more of an outpatient at this point. One's in Florida, one's in Georgia. How do the cases look? I mean, I've heard kind of variations of like, oh my gosh, we've peaked. It's now coming down. This is going away. I've heard people say, well, no, it really isn't. We're just seeing more of, um, or we're seeing less reporting necessarily because we're getting used to what to do with it. So Dr. Chastain, how do the, how does the numbers look in Georgia? So I guess the bad news is it's Georgia's top five, um, which is, not good to be at the at the upper end. Georgia is five as as of yesterday and, and late yesterday evening. I think there was close to twenty three thousand cases, um, and Georgia followed New York, Texas, California, and Florida. Um, but the large majority, about ninety eight percent or so, um, were being reported in Georgia at least were reported in men, um, and most of them were self reported as men who have sex with other men. So certainly shifting towards that um, sexual or close intimate contact. Um, and, and then most of the cases, especially in Georgia, are within that 26 to 45 year old group um, in people who identify as non-Hispanic, Black or African-American people. Um, so certainly a, a greater predominance. And, and I know that, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about this later on, but despite seeing that increased prevalence of cases within a certain group of individuals, anyone really is at risk. Yeah. Um, it's not just a certain specific patient population or a certain specific group of people, but that's where we've seen the large number of cases. Got it. I didn't realize we were in the top five. And I, of course, I'm in Georgia as well. And I'm just outside of Atlanta, which I think a large number of those cases were seen in the metropolitan area too. It's a really good point. And again, we're back. To, I talked about globalization of people coming from Africa here, but imagine just driving from Atlanta an hour away to the suburbs or two hours away to another town, you can see how that could spread very rapidly. Yeah. Dr. Luis, I know you're in Florida. Remind me again, what city are you in Florida? I'm in uh, the Tampa Bay area. So right. in between St. Pete, which has a large LGBTQ population and Tampa itself, which also has a large LGBTQ population. Not as large as Fort Lauderdale and Miami. But... Got it. And how are the numbers on the cases in Florida? Well, I, I think they surpass uh, Georgia. However, my last numbers is we had 2,300 cases, uh, at least reported. Um, I know there's lots that are go unreported. Right, right. I, you know, I, I think you guys both hit on this, and I, and I want to come back to it. One of, the thing the, one of the things the media has really latched onto is this feels like a gay man disease, much like HIV started in the 1980s. But Dr. Stan, you made a comment that anyone can be exposed, right? So yeah. this is not a one population virus. Is, is that a fair assessment? Absolutely. Um, I think the other thing that's really interesting is that, you know, it, it kind of brings me back to coronavirus very early on in the beginning in terms of reporting and, and how this information was reported. But, you know, the CDC will, does a great job of pro providing data and providing numbers, but at the same time, there are certainly limitations. And one of the main limitations or major limitations, at least, is that the data that they're collecting on monkeypox cases are based on um, assigned sex at birth and not necessarily gender. And so we can't know how many trans or non-binary or gender non-conforming individuals that are currently affected. So it's certainly a limitation and leads to some bias in terms of reporting and, and how this information is getting put out there. You know, I didn't even think about that. That's a good point. Dr. Luis, is it predominantly gay men in Florida as well that's self-reporting right now? That that's the most that I've seen is okay. um, many have sex with men. Um, you know, I always encompass the LGBTQ population when I talk about it because I don't want to single it out just for those reasons sure. that Daniel has yeah. mentioned. And honestly, I mean, this this virus travels by uh, prolonged physical contact, so and respiratory, but not as much. So I mean, it's just anybody can really get it. So now you know. Now I'm going to ask that question. Right? Define <laughs> prolonged. 
because you know I, because I, I'm thinking to myself, and I want to get into this because Dr. Chastain mentioned coronavirus and influenza is going to be coming up in the fall. This virus transmits differently than we've seen with flu and COVID, where it's, you know, six feet away or within six feet, you can sneeze on somebody, those kinds of things. With this situation, if you're just cuddling on the couch, you can yep. get this, right? Cuddling on the couch, and there's been some pets that have gotten monkeypox because of that um mainly dogs i don't think they know if it's in uh, uh, uh cats or not Got but it. yeah it it's really it ha for the most part it's exertional prolonged uh physical contact which is why some people have put that into the category of uh, sexually transmitted disease but you could be dancing in the club next to somebody for a prolonged period of time and rubbing up against them and and a sore and, and get it that way it Got also it. lives on surfaces like on bedding um, so that's also another concern to have. So linens, sheets, hand, like hand towels, those kinds of, you can get it from that? You can get it from the skin, the, uh, the scabbings coming off. Yep. You sure can. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm asking these questions because normally, you know, let's say, let's wear a mask. Well, to your point, that's not going to stop transmission of monkeypox virus. No, I mean, you can go dancing with a shirt on instead of a shirt off that would stop transmission or, you know, make sure they're not sharing a bed with, or not in somebody's bed who has monkeypox. Sure. That would... Touching linens, right? I mean, touching right. yeah. skin to linens. Yeah. You know, Dr. So... Chastain, I think about this a bit, you know, obviously there's different viruses out there. You, you talked about flu and COVID, which are not considered sexually transmitted, you know, viruses, but then we have HIV and herpes that are, does this virus transmit similar or is it different? I mean, like, you know, I, I'm asking that because it seems like this one transmits more readily while HIV isn't quite as, what's the right word I want to use? I want to use strong. Like, you know, HIV doesn't transmit quite as easily as this one. What makes this virus so hardy and healthy? Because holy cow, it could be on my sheets and I wouldn't even know it. Sure, sure. And, and, and I, I mean, certainly, you know, <clears throat> The risk of of, of transmission and um, from you know clothing and sheets and I've even seen some questions in terms of you know can I get this if I go into a store and try on a shirt or you know oh. pants or whatever and there's you know sure there's always the one off possibility that that's that's in, in theoretically could happen but it's typically you've got to scrub your arm fairly readily and fairly aggressively and assuming someone who had monkeypox and had an open lesion. Um, and had some of those infectious particles. So, I mean, if we compare, say, monkeypox to COVID, I mean, they're both zoonotic diseases, meaning that they were transmitted from animals to humans initially. And coronavirus is typically a respiratory disease. Um, so we have to breathe in those infected droplets, whereas monkeypox can be transmitted through respiratory secretions, but typically it's through direct and typically prolonged contact um, with the rash or scabs or some bodily fluids. Um, there's some emerging data um, that's posed the question in, in trying to look at, is it transmitted through um, seminal fluid or vaginal fluid? And the virus can be detected in those fluids, but not necessarily meaning that it is infectious. It's, it goes back to the same I'm sure everybody at this point is familiar with PCR. It's kind of a household word now with, with coronavirus, but it's being able to be detected in PCR, which means that it's present, but it may not be viable. It may not be able to replicate within that, within that fluid. And in fact, you know, that's the thing to remind folks, viruses are kind of fragile. They have to have a host to live where bacteria are a little bit different. So that's the reason we can't use antibiotics against this thing because antibiotics don't kill viruses. So that's a really good point about it may be there, but it just can't do anything because it's not, doesn't have the strength. You guys talked a little bit about this already, but I think I want to talk to folks about, okay, so we see this rash coming on, or we see these symptoms, this flu-like symptoms. You sh what precautions should I now take so I don't hurt anybody else in my orbit, like in my household or come to work or those kinds of things? Dr. Luis, what do you tell folks about how they should act if they're suspicious that this could be monkeypox that they're seeing? Yeah, so really good question. What I told people is to, first of all, stay home. If they have rashes, they want to keep them covered. 
Uh, if they're sharing beds, they want to separate out the beds. And of course, the, the person with the symptoms should be in the bed with that has the old linens and the other person should get new ones because there will be uh, ways to transmit on, um, on those old linens. Um, and to contact their healthcare provider as soon as possible, which tends to be me when I'm telling them that. How quickly does a, this rash looks weird to holy heck, this is what they were talking about that podcast. This looks like monkey pox. How long does it take? Once the rash shows up, it doesn't take long. Uh, I've seen like the rash show up and then it within a couple of days, there's more. They'll all start coming at the same time, which means they're all going away at the same time. The problem is it can last somewhere from two to three weeks or two to four weeks. Wow. So I, I guess one thing is I'm walking into work with this rash. If I see the rash, I should just stop that day and ask you know what I'm saying? Because I think a lot of people, I, I'm guilty of this. What I feel really bad, I'm like, oh, it's not the flu. It's, it's, I have allergies. It's fine. And then three days later, it's the flu. And I have, you know, walked around and talked to like three different people. And yeah, it's, yeah. If, if it's not visible, so they change the recommendations early on. It's like, if you have the rash, stay home, don't be around anybody. If it's not visible, you should be wearing a mask because okay. it can be transmitted respiratory, though very less likely, um, unless you're having a real heated discussion for a really long time. Got it. Um, and you should keep all the rashes covered at all times. Okay. Um, but, I, you know, I think there's still a lot of emerging data coming out about that. So I have just told people it's probably best to just work from home, which is an option for a lot of people. Yeah, I like that be safe kind of scenario. You mentioned the fact that this can take up to three weeks. When do I stop giving people the virus? Is it like the flu after a few days, it stops shedding? Or is this something that I have to worry about all the way through those three weeks? It, it stops. So once that last scab falls off and you've got a new layer of epithelial skin underneath there, that's when you don't transmit anymore. Holy cow. So even if it's scabbed over, I'm Correct. still, I can still, so I have to wait for whole new skin and that scab to fall off. Yes, sir. Holy cow. That's, that's one of the problems with this because the scabs are infectious and then can be transmitted as well. Oh, I'm glad but, you mentioned that because I would assume, okay, it's healing. I got the scab on it. Yeah. You know, I'm good to go. I may not look pretty, but I feel like I'm on the road to mend. But now you're telling me that I need to wait for those scabs to go away completely or I could give this to someone else. And until there's a new layer of skin underneath, you're still infectious. Okay. Huh. I'm just sort of thinking about these poor folks who have it in their mouth or in their in their anus and just right. the amount of pain they must They're, have waiting for those scabs. Well, and the pain usually goes away. Those scabs... So those areas are ones where you can get um, treatment, which I'm sure is something you want to talk about, yep, um, I do. which which accelerates the healing process. The pain usually that's left over there is from the scar tissue that's formed afterwards. Okay. But, but usually once you get them, the tecoviramate, things go pretty quickly. Okay. So you mentioned, say, say the drug name again for me. I hope I'm saying it right. Tecoviramate. Tecoveramate. It actually sounds like a type of pasta, but yeah. so, I, I, you know, you just talked about, I, I want people to sort of think about the progress of this, where the mouth and the anus, it may look different in terms of scabbing versus what's on the hands, but you should wait till everything is sort of healed over before. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, that's important because I think it's weird that you have sores in your mouth and on the hand. Yeah. They really look different, right? Right. So the ones on their, on your skin and so the ones on your skin, like on your chest and on your back, they look like little zits, they get inflamed. It's exactly like bad acne in bad places. The ones on your hands look very thick and very angry, just very, a coarse. Mm -hmm. Those ones can be very, very painful. The ones in your mouths just look like a little bit of a pus pocket and usually some like erythema or some redness around it. Same thing in your rectum, your anus. And those are a little harder to, to, to see but when you see it, you know, I mean, it's like this white spot, it's a sore, there can be several of them. Got it. So, so Dr. Chastain, we're going to talk about the drug in a second, but just as a common effort here, do you think swishing with salt water rinses and using sitz baths would help people with their symptoms versus, I mean, we're going to talk about drug in a second. Do you think that would be anything? I don't know. I mean, I... I'm sure it, it would make me a little nervous um, okay. if I have some open lesions to to sit in some of that personally at least. Right. 
I'm just sort of thinking about how would you calm that down so you could go to the bathroom or have a meal or, you know, that kind of thing. So I will, I will toss in and, you know, I do infectious diseases. I don't think about, um, you know, pain control is not something that I tend to to think about at the forefront of my mind, but it's been a, I guess a couple weeks ago, there was a, uh, a letter from the CDC that really addressed a lot of pain control um, in people with monkeypox and, and pushed um, stool softeners and bowel regimens, um, you know, whether they were getting opiates for pain medications or, or, or not, but really trying to think about more of the, the symptom management rather than just treating the virus in and of yeah. itself. So I think you bring up a really good point in terms of, of trying to make sure that we're, we're meeting these individuals where they are in terms of pain and making sure that we're controlling that pain and providing, you know, improved quality of life overall. Yeah. Dr. Lewis, have you had any tips that you've told folks to, for, for symptom management? I'll get to the drugs in a moment, but I just sure. think, golly, if this is three weeks long, I, I don't know if I could tolerate that for three weeks. I've had many discussions with this, a lot of different healthcare providers in like some of the hotbed cities like Chicago and New York yeah. and Fort Lauderdale, what to do with patients like this. But we've, uh, you know, early on, some physicians were trying to use uh, like opiates, which we totally told them, please don't do that. That's going to cause constipation. It's going to rip things. There's sores there already. It's friable. So issues. opiates, for those who are listening, opiates are like Percocet, Vicodin, uh, morphine. Those are fentanyl. Those are the kind of things that you get prescription-wise from your, from your physician, but they will slow down the way you poop. So you'll get constipated from it. And it sounds like that's that would be a bad thing for this situation because of the lesions. So what, what did you recommend or what's being recommended? So we came up with gabapentin uh, to use, which is uh, a, um, of course, now I'm not going to remember what it is, but it slows down neuropathic um, signaling and can help, yeah, it can help just deal, dull the pain. Um, And that has been very successful, especially in the rectal area. Sits baths are also good because it can dry out some of those, uh, the lesions. Um, For the mouth, you know, Lidocaine, sure, can work, but it can also be very, in the mouth, not so much, but in the rectal area, it can be very irritating to the mucosal area down yeah, there, I mean, so it's not something that I suggest, but it's really been like gabapentin, gabapentin, ibuprofen, and Tylenol. Got it. Dr. Chastain, how does that sound as the pharmacist? Would that be something that seems reasonable? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think gabapentin is a prescription drug for everybody out there. It is generic. You can get it. It slows down the way the nerves communicate with each other. So it sort of takes the zing out of the pain. Um, The reason I asked about the sitz bath is because if anybody's ever like gone through a rectal surgery or they've had hemorrhoid removed, I always hear the GI doc say, use a saltwater bath or a sitz bath. That's the reason I was asking about that. So that makes sense. Tell me the drug again, Dr. Luis, that you mentioned. Oh, gosh. T-pox or tecoveramate? Te- See, I'm just trying to make him say it again. Dr. Yeah. Chastain, have we been saying it correctly? Hey, I like it. It sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> so tecoparavate. Veramate. Veramate. Tecoveramate. Yeah. Dr. Chastain, how does this thing work? Because this is actually a treatment for the virus, right? Right. And, and it actually uh, was initially approved for smallpox. Um, we know that it has activity against monkeypox. Um, so... Uh, Tegoviramat or T-pox um, will ultimately prevent the virus from leaving that infected individual. So it stops the spread of the virus in your body. Does it make you heal faster or does it make your symptoms go away faster? So there's been emerging data um, in that area. And I think some of the most recent data that um, I saw talked about the median. So the 50% um, of individuals who had um, Tegoviramat had symptom improvement and this is subjective symptom improvement within about three days so it oh. seems as though the the progression has been has been or well the improvement has been faster um there's been some personal reports of patients talking about it melts away lesions after the first couple of doses so certainly seem to have have benefit um with little to to no overall harm from a side effect standpoint got it you know, it, it sounds a lot like, you know how people take Tamiflu, you know, you get the flu and you take Tamiflu. It doesn't make the virus go away, but it lessens the symptoms and you might not be as sick for long, as long. So that sounds, this sounds similar from monkeypox. Um, Dr. Luis, have you prescribed this for your patients? Several times, um, mostly for patients who are immunocompromised or if they have lesions in the, uh, 
in the sensitive area. So Got it. rectal or mouth. I want to get to those that are immunocompromised in a moment, because I think that patient population has grown dramatically. And there are a lot of people in the community who, who are going to identify with that. Before I do, though, what's the going, how do you take T-pox? What's the dose? So it depends on size, but really it's like six, three, three horse pills twice a day, 600 milligrams twice a so day with, with a fatty meal. Okay. So it's oral. So it's a pill. Yes. Well, a fat, you know what? A fatty meal, if I'm hurting as bad as you think I'm going to hurt, how am I going to eat to get that down? Right. So I had one patient take olive oil. He would just drink some olive oil, make sure he had enough fat. And I was like, I don't know that that's exactly what we want, but to start with, sure, that's that's what we should do. Well, at least he was um, a genius about it. Bless yeah. His <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> but, you know, I think people, when they get to that stage, will we'll do what the doctor says because they don't want to be in pain and they want it to go away as fast as they I can. I was just saying, thinking out loud about how, you know, you can eat the meal and take these horse pills. And it's it's twice a day or once a day? Twice a day. So you have to do it twice. Yeah. You, and for people in the hospital who can't do oral, there is IV therapy as okay. well. And that's where Dr. Chastain, I was going to ask, have you had anybody be admitted to the hospital from monkeypox in which you've had to use IV T-pox? Fortunately, no. Thankfully, no. Um, we haven't made it there yet. Okay. And that, most of this is being treated outpatient, right? I mean, I'm not, dec- I'm not saying the severity is not there, but it seems like most people can handle this without being admitted. Is that, a, is that a fair statement? Yes, I have only known of three patients that needed to be, and not and not in Florida, this is word of mouth or other providers who had them that had to be admitted because, because they couldn't eat anything and the pain was so bad. Yeah. So mainly for pain control. Yeah, that's what I would think too. I, I think, you know, as you guys talk about the different populations and it could be incredibly severe, it could be a light case, as we say, uh, the lesions could be everywhere, but one group that stands out to me are those that are immunocompromised. And you mentioned this, Dr. Luis, and I think just for those listening, what this means is your immune system or the system that sort of keeps out all the viruses and bacteria and helps you fight those infections. It's not working as well as maybe other folk. So give me some examples of people, how you, how one would become immunocompromised. What things make us immunocompromised? One of the biggest things is HIV. is okay. immunocompromised rising disease, Got it. but Crohn's disease, um, having a transplant, um, those are some other um, medical issues that, that make you immunocompromised. So lupus. Lupus. Uh, MS. MS is another one. Um, rheumatoid arthritis. Any, rheumatoid. any of the autoimmune diseases, absolutely. Yeah. Late, you know, late I, term pregnancy. Good. That, see, I was going to talk about pregnant ladies oh, versus pregnant and, men. And, and uh, the one thing about I, I'm asking about here is because I think a lot of people go, well, that's not me because I don't have a transplant or I don't have the obvious, I don't have HIV, so I'm not immunocompromised. But there are certain things that do compromise the way we fight infections, and it does heighten your risk here in terms of monkeypox being more severe, correct? Correct. And and in, in the population that I have seen, which is a small sample size, but even the case studies I read, the ones that were immunocompromised had a bigger spread of of the, the uh, lesions and they were hit harder. And so the T-pox really for those folks should be, a, should be a must. If they can tolerate it and they don't have any reason not to use it, that would really help them out a lot. Correct. Okay. There, there has been one death with uh, monkeypox and it was somebody in LA who was immunocompromised. I saw and that. He, yeah. Like that's what this T-pox is for is to stop that from happening. I think Dr. Chastain, you know, you and I are pharmacists. The other area that I that I think about is, you know, biologics have really risen in use lately. That we use them for everything, from dermat, use them for um, psoriasis. We use them for does and those knock down your immune system a little bit, the way they work, correct? Sure, certainly. I mean, I'm sure since we've been on this on this webinar, this this podcast, there's probably been five or six that have been approved. Um, yeah, yeah. That, they, you know, they come out. Yeah, very, very rapidly. But, you know, each one targets different types of of cells or different types of receptors. So it's not a a one size fits all, you know, any biologic. Humira is not the same as Remicade is not the same as a drug for 
multiple sclerosis, for example, each one will carry a different risk, but to a certain degree, there is some suppression of the immune system, and even steroids too. Um, you know, like we saw it, like prednisone or even dexamethasone now with the with coronavirus. I mean, it, it seems like a dime a dozen from a, from the standpoint of um, how much dexamethasone is being given. So that certainly has a, a possibility of suppressing your immune system as well. Got it. So, you know, the reason I'm, I'm asking this question is because if you're on a biologic for those guys that are out there on those things and ladies are pre steroids like prednisone for long periods of time, you should be talking with your primary care physician about your risk factors here. And especially if you fall in the category, we would talk about men who have sex with men right now seems to be the predominant group, but anybody out there that is having close personal contact with, you know, folks, you're not quite sure their medical history, you know, this could be something to talk about. I think earlier, Dr. Luis, you, you really talked about the fact that if the rash comes on, you know, within a few days that it's monkeypox, really, you should be talking with someone about T-pox and getting it as quickly as possible. Is that fair? That, very fair. Yeah. The sooner I, you start, the sooner the symptoms will go away. I, just like Tamiflu. Got it. And, you know, I think, Dr. Chastain, the other thing that I wanted to bring up, we've talked about T-pox, but that doesn't make the news as much as this vaccine. And I think it was there was a shortage issue for a minute. How are, How is the access now to those who've not had monkeypox, but might be at an increased risk, for example, those that say are immunocompromised? How are, is access to the vaccine better than what it was? So I don't know if there's, if the shortage has been resolved per se, um, but I think we got... A little bit smarter in terms of how we administer it. Um, from what I've seen in, in, in the data that I've seen, it's still very limited in terms of who's able to get it um, and even where it's able to be accessed. Yeah. Most of the uh, most of the recommendations tend to be at, for individuals, quote unquote, who are at high risk, um, whether that be through recent exposure or that be in one of the groups that we previously talked about. Um, but I mean, admittedly, I. I played on the Georgia Department of Public Health website, and it took a little bit of time to find where to get this genius vaccine, which is the one that, that everybody's after. And we typically used to give it subcutaneously. Um, it was a larger dose, um, but there's been some data that suggests that we can give it intradermally, um, typically in the forearm, which is not the most aesthetically appealing location, um, and can get about five doses for every one subcutaneous dose. So hold on. So I know my dad's listening to this podcast going, what, and I could do my, I could do a Southern accent, but I'm not even going to try, but <laughs> what the hell is intradermally? Because that, I've, I mean, obviously the flu shot goes in my arm. Um, you know, so did the COVID shot. If this goes in my forearm. Does it go deep like the flu shot does? No, no so typically not, not, not in the same depth. Um, subcutaneous goes in the fat, in your fatty tissue. Okay. And this goes more so in the, in the superficial skin. So it's just, it's a shorter needle, right? It's very, yeah, it's not like the needle we see with other shots that we're used to. It's it's just angled different. Okay. They don't, it, the needle's the same. They just angle it and they go for a region that doesn't have a lot of fat. And you so you have skin there that they can get into. Yeah. I, I want people to understand that because, you know, if you came at my forearm with a needle, I'd be like, okay, where do you think you're going with that? Um, then the other thing is, what's the reaction that you want to happen now that we've changed this to intradermal as the way we give the shot? I don't know that you want a reaction, but I can tell you that there are reactions that are happening. But your skin should do, what's it called, Dr. Chastain? It's, it's a wheel, right? So you can certainly see a wheel. Absolutely. And it's yeah. not, I think that's one of the, the main drawbacks of, of this into the skin we'll call it injection, is that it's almost um, a, a mark, if you will, um, and, and somewhat exposing your lifestyle if that's not something that you're comfortable sharing with everyone. Yeah, the reason I said that is because I had read an article for those that are immunocompromised, if you get that wheel or that reaction where your skin kind of swells up a little bit where you did it, it shows that your body reacted to the vaccine. Which, you know, we do that. We also do this with testing for TB, right? Uh, for tuberculosis. This is completely a different virus, a different bug to worry about. But I'm at, I was asking that question because I don't want people to freak out if they get like a little bubble where they had that shot. That, that's not a new monkey pox. We didn't give them a we didn't give them a pimple, basically. Right. Well, just to interject. So what has been happening? Because... No pun intended. Just to interject. Did you really <laughs> say that? OK. All right. Um. 
what has been happening because the interdermal is, is a lot stronger. You're you're using a fifth of what you were using before. Got People are having pretty good. We like to see it reactions, but you know you can get like a, a good six to eight centimeter uh, redness around the shot of if not more than that and people have been very panicking about that but that's normal it, and yeah. it does go away we Remember, just we just told them watch for rashes sores yeah. pimples and then we give them a shot that make gives them redness sores yeah. and then maybe even a little raised dot and i'm like well yeah i'd scare the heck out of me too and and it hurts it's it's not like just a little bit of itch it hurts the sub q one yeah um, i got my shot it was it was pretty intense for like a good two weeks i've yet to get the intradermal injection but i've seen several of them and some of them have been pretty it's been pretty intense but this is really important to get especially if in, you're in one of the uh at-risk communities and I, Just, mean, I know i know you say it hurts but then i think to myself do i want lesions in my mouth for three weeks and <laughs> I, you know what i'll take the forearm a little bit of pain yeah yeah just out of curiosity and not to to totally derail us, but have you sure. seen individuals who get intradermal that want to go back to sub Q or vice versa? Well, they don't really have a choice. And usually it's okay. like, yeah, because the CDC was like, look, now we're going to do it intradermally. And they gave that order. And so all the Department of Health and everybody who's been giving this out changed it over to intradermally. It just, it's, uh, yeah, so we don't really have a choice in the matter. I think, Dr. Chesson, the only people who can get it sub-Q now are those with keloids or a history of keloids. Right. Um, right. And then they really are sort of pushing it. Even those that are immunocompromised, they're pushing to the intradermal as well. So for the, that, that's the reason I want people that do have maybe a history to know what to look for. Because I think it's important that if you get a vaccine, you know if you're being covered or not. And then the second part of that is, this is a two-shot series, right? Correct. How, how much time between the first one and the second one, Dr. Chastain? Four weeks, 28 Four weeks. Days. When does, a, as a pharmacist, when would you tell somebody that they now have immunity from monkeypox with the vaccine? When does that kick in? So typically two weeks after your last dose. So from the day you start, a six-week total. Okay. So my first dose, while it's there, is kind of a starting point, but I'm not covered yet. I've got to wait until two weeks after the second dose. Right. And then I, I can then go out and dance with my shirt off, as Dr. Luis tells me I can do for a longer period of time, although no one wants to see that ever. So the so I'm just sort of making sure, because I, I was talking to someone previously, like, oh, I got the vaccine, I'm good to go. I'm like, well, not really, right? You've got a lag time in there that you have to be careful with, and I want folks to understand that. And if you are immunosuppressed or immunocompromised, it might take just a little bit longer. So just be careful out there. You guys have done a really nice job summarizing this. Um, you scared me a little bit, but you've educated me even more. And I have a better idea of, of how to talk to people now about T-pox, what it does, when it should happen. But also, I think how this is different than maybe other things that we're dealing with. I always ask this to the guest on if they could give me three pearls, because we've talked about a great deal for the audience. So I'm going to start with Dr. Luis and say, what three pearls would you like to leave the listening audience with from what we talked about today? Or maybe something I didn't even ask. Oh, well, definitely, if you're sick, stay home. Okay. If there's a vaccine or some other way to protect yourself, do it. And I, I don't know. I don't know. Don't, don't get prairie dogs. They don't sound like <laughs> a good pet. Yeah. Yeah. Choose, choose a different pet. That's, that's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually a good pearl. Dr. Chastain. You can get a, get a Chia pet. That seems to, maybe that's the safest place of all. Um, oh, that sounds like my kind of pet. I think the, I think to me and stemming off some of those things, I, I think the first to me is, you know, assess your own risk and, and figure out, are you in a high risk category? Are you an individual who has a need to get the vaccine and if so then pursue it I, I think that you know it takes a little bit of time and it may take a little bit of travel to access the vaccine um but please by all means do so um i think the other just to put a plug in for now that we're getting into you know september and fall and flu shots is that you should be able to get both the genius vaccine and the flu shot at the exact same time um separate spots, of course, but there's nothing that says that you can't. They're both based on non-replicating viruses, so should be able to, to do that with no problem. Number two, 
I've had questions about, you know, brief contact, whether it be shaking somebody's hands or shaking somebody's hand or, you know, just brief contact in public. And it's not that easy. Uh, again, there's always that one-off possibility that, that may exist somewhere out there, but typically you need some prolonged exposure um, to acquire this virus. And so, you know, just a, a casual contact isn't enough to get you there. And then I think the other thing is that, you know, we've seen stuff in the news and, and online about cases dropping. And I think that's great and, and nice, but based on some reports from local health departments and even across the, the nation and even globally, we don't really have enough resources to combat this. So it's going to be hard to keep that downward trend staying that way. Um, there's tons of uh, increasing cases in Peru and Brazil, um, Nigeria. There was a really fantastic New York Times article um, earlier this week talking about um, South America and how I mean, they can't even get testing. They can't even get vaccines or even T-pox for that matter. Um, so it's not just a, a U.S. thing. It's global. And, and as we've seen this, you know, the push for global health is that it's going to affect us again over and over again until we can, you know, eradicate some of these disparities and, and have equity with, you know, testing and treatment. Yeah, I think those are good points. I, I think the other thing is, as this goes further, it's going to leave the specific population we've been talking about and impact anyone who has sexual contact with someone else. So my philosophy is if you're not monogamous, both of you, then you need to talk about this vaccine in the future when it becomes more apparent and also, I guess, more abundant, if you will. That's a really good point. I also want to say you said non-replicating virus. Basically, it's dead viruses in these things. We're not giving anybody a live virus with the flu or with uh, the monkeypox vaccine. You guys, I thank you so much. I love doing this with two different professions because the perspectives are similar yet different. It brings something to the table that maybe I just never thought of even asking. So thank you so much for tag teaming this and talking a bit about this. And once again, thanks for spending some time with uh, Farmcast for the community so our community can hear more about this particular virus and how to protect themselves. For those out there, again, my name is Dr. Tim Brown. Thanks so much for tuning in. Remember, October, we're going to talk about naloxone access and how to save the lives of those around you who may be using opioids. Uh, Even those who are getting them legally and using them for prescription use, they're still at risk for overdose. So don't think this only pertains to folks that are doing drugs, so to speak. This can pertain to anybody, from your grandmother who uses pain meds for your knees to even that person that's just coming out of the hospital post-surgery. So we'll talk all about all that next month with Georgia Overdose Prevention. Until then, thanks so much for tuning in to Farmcast for the Community. We'll see you next week.